What's going on, y'all? It's Javon.ca, and we're here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. And on this episode, we dive deep into purpose and how you can find it. Now, our special guest today went on a journey from corporate to starting a super successful business, but closing it and starting something brand new. I'm really excited to take you on this journey with us together as we dive into how you might be able to find your purpose and find that spark inside you that really gets you going. Now, there's a lot of people that get caught in these jobs that really are looking for a way out. And on this episode, Farah peels back some of the questions and some of her answers on how she found it for herself. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited to introduce you to our next guest, Farah Kimji, but we'll give her a moment to introduce herself. I am Farah Kimji. I am the founder of Purpose to Profit. I also am a podcaster, so I have the Purpose to Profit podcast, if you want to tune in. Um, so I basically help people discover their purpose and then monetize their purpose. Um, I think it's, I think we all have one and I think that it's our life's mission to figure that out and to be able to show up in what I call a real estate term. So I used to work in commercial real estate and there's a term that we always use called highest and best use, right? So we look at that as like, what's the highest and best use of a a property Mm. or a piece of land, uh, or a parking lot. But I like to think about it as like, what's the highest and best use of Farah or Javon? Like, you know, and and when you figure that out, that's where the magic happens. When you can show up in the best way possible for you, you feel aligned and everyone else gets to benefit from you showing up that way. So I help people figure out their highest and best use. So what's your highest and best use? As of as of Yeah, as no, of and I, I think it's a great question because I do think it evolves, right? Okay. As we evolve, as we grow as people. So for me, it's always been about using my voice in some capacity mm. um, and all, also teaching. Right. And so I think my highest and best use is to use my voice to teach others to like make their dreams possible. So I say my purpose is I help people bring their big ideas and dreams to life Hmm. through my voice, through my podcast, through coaching, through consulting, Mm -hmm. whatever that's going to look like. It's less about the hows for me because I think the hows change, but the why stays the same. I always want to be doing something where. I'm helping people bring their big ideas and dreams to life. So was there ever a time that you weren't at your highest and best use? Oh, yeah. Interestingly enough, it was when I was working in commercial real estate. Okay. I would say, and I don't think of it as like, oh, I wasn't at my highest and best use. I mean, some people would say you, I was at the height of my career when I was in in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I needed to go through that journey to be able to get to the place that I am now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another saying I like that people say is like, your mess is your message. Mm. And I feel, I'm not that I was a mess, but I feel like I needed to go through all the trials and tribulations of all the years and chapters that happened before today. Yeah. And commercial real estate was part of that and accounting was part of that. And, um, but I use all of those skills now still, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's the thing. So it's not that I wasn't at my highest and best use. I think each part of it was helping me get to my highest and best use. And yeah. part of that is going through the shit of things. Sorry, yeah. I don't know if we swear on this Listen, podcast, Farah, but we just did. <laughs> it's your world. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah, okay. There we go. So, you think we could go through some of those chapters? Like, sure. how did you even get here? How did you even, you know, walk us through a little bit of the background of yours? Yeah. So, I'll try to give you the Coles notes because I am a little bit wordy, but I'll, okay. I'll take you back. So, I grew up in London, Ontario. My parents were immigrants from uh, Kenya to to Canada to London Ontario back in the 70s right and okay. so the one thing that my dad really valued was education he believed education was going to be the thing that would you know bring up our family right yeah. and he came he literally came here with nothing mm-hmm. And so my early years were really focused on education. And at the time, that also meant going into a very specific path of either becoming a doctor a lawyer, or an engineer accountant. or a lawyer. <laughs> well, a lawyer and accountant in our family were less oh, actually important as really? like doctor and engineer. So my okay. dad was an engineer. My mom became a, a foot doctor, a chiropodist. And so the science route was kind of like the route that mm. my father was pushing because that's what he knew. Right. Yeah. yeah. And both my sister and I, so she's four years older, she actually was the one to kind of like go off the path and ended up in, she started in science, but ended up in international development and political science and then went the law route. Okay. And so she's four years older. So I saw her example and I was just like, I don't want to go the math and science route either. Mm -hmm. So I purposefully, this is like taking us back a while. I was one of the last people to do OAC, but you needed these OAC credits, grade 13, essentially 
to get into university. And if you didn't take the science ones, like if you didn't take OAC chemistry or a physics, you couldn't go into You're done university for, <laughs> uh, for science. And yeah. I just didn't take them. Mm. Okay. You needed six OACs. I took 11. I just didn't take those ones mm. <laughs> intentionally. Okay. So I went the business route without really knowing um, where that was going to take me. I yeah. just thought business. I One day I'd love to own my own business. I didn't know even what that meant. Once you're in business school, they don't really teach you how to start a business. It's actually not about that at all. No, it's about <laughs> it's like, working. here's accounting, here's yeah. finance, here's the marketing. Yeah. And all I saw was that the accountants, the people who were in the accounting stream ahead of me, were getting jobs right out of yeah. school. They were getting yeah. these like $45,000 a month or year, sorry, yeah. salaries, <laughs> I wish, right? Yeah. Um, and they were getting hired in their fourth year mm -hmm. and they were getting a chance to go work downtown Toronto. So is that the reason why you chose accounting? That's, that's the only reason. I was living in London. Well, mm -hmm. I was in school in Hamilton at the time. Okay. I McMaster. was thinking, what's going to, yeah, McMaster University. Okay. Like, what's going to get me to downtown Toronto so I can work in one of these tall buildings and feel important and wear a suit and be in yeah. business? Why so do you, I, why do you I think went accounting. That was, why was that the job though? Like, why would, why did you define success as that? Oh, because that's what I think. I saw like the examples of success around me at the time, right? Mm -hmm. We're going back to like early 2000s yeah. when I was going through this. And so there weren't examples of like young female entrepreneurs. Now there so are you tons. Were, you were going to university at, at in early 2000s? Yeah, so when yeah. You were I like, graduated in 06. So, so when you were like five, six. <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Imagine. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm definitely giving away my age here, which is fine. But yeah, I was in school from 2002 to 2006. So it was okay. a very different world where that type of a job was considered successful yeah. starting at a pwc mm -hmm. downtown toronto as a chartered accountant mm -hmm. seemed like you just won the lottery that was it that was it yeah. you're made you can make partner in this firm and i very quickly realized you know i started there and i just was like oh this is what accounting is and i get that the early years are very much grunt work everyone goes through it yeah. you got to earn your stripes i get that but i just pretty quickly realized my my life wasn't meant to like just be behind a desk and mm -hmm. crunching numbers. Yes, there was some client facing uh, opportunity, which was the part I loved. Yeah, but that wasn't 100 percent of the time. So I realized, OK, I'm not going to stay at this accounting firm. So I decided to go into commercial real estate. Okay. Um, I had some commercial. I didn't actually decide. I had some commercial real estate clients at the time while I was at PwC. So when I decided I wanted to go work in industry and I was interviewing, the types of roles that were coming at me were based on accounting and real, real estate. estate. Yeah. And so I ended up at Oxford Properties, which was a great place to work. Great, mm -hmm. you know, great first job. And, uh, and were not you just first, doing like first property, job. Property, property yeah, accounting? Yeah, property accounting. Exactly. Okay. I had this, you know, five people reporting into me. Again, I thought I had made it. I was a manager was of property accounting at Oxford, managing 2.5 million square feet of real estate worth billions of dollars in, you know, all the downtown markets in Canada. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a big deal. That and was it was it. a That's big the trophy. Deal. Right? It was you the trophy. You finally made it. But Your again, I, I was in there six months and I realized, ooh, I don't think this is it either. Mm -hmm. So I went and actually did my MBA part time while working full time. Okay. I did it through Laurier University. What made you want to go like the the MBA route? Yeah. So that was uh, me saying I don't want to be like put in a box of like a bean counter for the rest of my life. Like I don't want to <laughs> just be about numbers and yeah. reporting on numbers. And I thought that doing an MBA would help me diversify okay. from just the accounting piece of the finance, you know, business yeah. world. And it did actually. Okay. So I went, I did this MBA. Uh, they had a campus downtown Toronto, Laurier did. So I would go to work and then on weekends I would go to school and evenings I'd go to school and do this part-time awesome. MBA. It took me a couple of years. Um, my favorite course there was entrepreneurship, mm. surprise, surprise, um, and strategic brand marketing. Those were like okay. my two favorite courses. All right. Um, and as soon as I graduated from it, uh, a company was looking for a combination of a CA MBA in commercial real estate. Okay. And they were a startup private equity firm. So I got hired there. I left, you know, the big PWCs and the Oxfords to go to a startup. And I remember my dad thinking like, even when I left PWCs, like, what are you doing? And then Oxford, Crazy. oh, okay, why are you leaving Oxford, yeah. right? And then yeah. I, I decided to go to this like startup and it was probably one of the best decisions I made really? from a perspective of getting that first taste of what it's like to be an entrepreneur. While I didn't start the company, I was employee number four. Yeah. So there's the two, the CEO, COO, 
an analyst and I was hired as the VP of finance mm-hmm. and there was no CFO. Mm-hmm. So I was the acting CFO and there was never a CFO the entire time I was there. Mm-hmm. I was sort of, you know, on that track. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was there for five years. Wow. So that's where I was. And I was working in this industry and I learned a lot. Okay. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. I learned what it was like to start a fund, mm-hmm. to go from one fund to three funds, to adding a debt fund, an asset management platform, overseeing all that, closing deals, working with lenders, working with lawyers, like yeah. got to experience all of that. Wow. But I also got to experience what I call the ugly side of the business, mm-hmm. which is uh, seeing what it's like when people are in it for the wrong reasons, uh, building communities and buildings for, you know, just thinking about the bottom line, the return to their investors, but yeah. not really like, are we leaving this community better off? You know, there was part of that. And then also just male, it's a very male dominated industry. Yeah. And I felt like I had to work double mm-hmm. to just be Good at, heard. like be recognized at the same level. Mm-hmm. And I didn't just feel it. I was actually told that once. Wow. Yeah. I like my boss walked in on a meeting one time where I was hosting some networking association meeting and there was, Mm -hmm. he walked in by accident to the boardroom and then later he saw me, he's like, oh wow, there's a lot of women in the room. And I was like, you mean three out of 11? And he's like, back in my day, there was only like maybe one, if that, Mm -hmm. 0.5 essentially, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, and you know, the women who really succeeded in, in the industry, they had, you know, they worked twice as hard as the men and had to be twice as smart. And he said this to me and I was like, yeah. well, should they have had to mm-hmm. do that? Mm-hmm. And like, and then he kind of backtracked, mm-hmm. realizing like what he was saying out loud. And in that moment, I realized this is how I'm seen as like, in yeah. order to be seen as an equal, I have to work twice as hard and be twice as smart. Like that's a dub, that's a tax that I don't want to pay. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want to be like seen right away. As, and so after a couple of years of, you know, going through that, being in that industry, I started to look at what else I wanted to do. Yeah. And I eventually realized, what I wanted to do just didn't exist. Like mm-hmm. I wanted to take the fact that I liked commercial real estate. I was good at finance. I was really interested in like the innovation space within commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was also heading up a lot of diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives within the commercial real estate space. Yeah. So I was like, what can I do that like encompasses all of those things? And I was like, this, it just doesn't exist. So I left. Yeah, yeah. I left to start my own business. And okay. the first version of my business was actually all of that. I was helping um, early stage tech founders mm-hmm. in the real estate space. So we call it prop tech mm-hmm. to raise capital. And I was primarily cool. working with females and di- diverse founders. So mm-hmm. I was taking my background in, you know, private equity in, you know, being an accountant, MBA, in the real estate space, liking the innovation, working with diverse founders, like all the things that kind of like, you know, I'd gone through, like, that's why I say your mess is your message. Yeah. All of those things had to happen for me to get to that place of realizing I can make a business out of this. Mm -hmm. But I I won't say it was like as smooth as that, but that's kind of how that transition came about. That's that's cool. That's really cool. So and now when when did purpose to profits become a thing? Oh, my gosh. It's been an evolution. You, so you got me on the edge of my seat. Right yeah, now. right. Like, oh, no. This is a movie I don't so, want. To no commercials, please. Right? Like, keep going. <laughs> it, it really started with the purpose piece. I think yeah. I went on a journey of a lot just happening in my life, making mm-hmm. this transition to entrepreneurship. You know, um, I, I got like at that same time, I got separated, got divorced. All this yeah. st- stuff was happening, and I was just like. I need my life to mean something Mm -hmm. like, and I don't want it to just be making rich people richer. Like I kind of started going through like, what as far as contribution on this earth going to be about? Yeah. And I started to like interact with the word purpose. Mm, And if you look up the word purpose, just the definition of it, it means the reason for which something is created or for which something exists. Mm. And when you think about that from a personal perspective, perspective that's really quite heavy right like why do i exist why was i created yeah but i was like fascinated so i was doing what one does all the listening to all the podcasts like you know untethered soul different books and and just going through that journey Mm -hmm. and then realizing that like as i was choosing a more purposeful path or what i thought was a more purposeful path Mm -hmm. it felt amazing and i wanted to share that with more people so Mm -hmm. i was like how can i teach about purpose yeah like i'm not jay shetty i'm not a monk like you know what i mean <laughs> you but got the tea, though. how can i like <laughs> ma- yeah i was like how can i make it in a way that is like 
someone can actually digest this word yeah, and yeah. use it in a practical sense. Mm. And while I was thinking about this, I was thinking about like, what's the feeling when that you have when you feel like you're living a life of purpose or you're hmm. you're in that moment even maybe you're not a full life but in this moment yeah. this is exactly where i'm supposed to be doing huh. exactly what i'm supposed to be doing for exactly who i'm supposed to be doing it for yeah. we've probably all had those moments that might be this moment for you right now yeah. right like of as course. A, right yeah. and so in the i was like what does that feeling feel like it feels like the feeling of flow mm. right like being in flow in sync with the universe we all talk about this feeling of like oh my, I'm in such flow right now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's such a good feeling when you're in that space. Like time almost stands still. Yeah. And then when you check the clock, it's like, oh, shit, oh my this gosh, was right? nine hours. It was, yeah. and, and you didn't even like maybe stop for a meal no, or no answer your phone. No meal, nothing, no water break, right? no lunch break, no it's nothing. It's like the best feeling ever. So I, I kid you not, I must have really been in flow when I was like thinking about this. I'm like, how can I like, how can you teach a feeling? You can't wow. teach a feeling. Deep. I was on the treadmill. I'm like, okay flow okay and th and within 30 seconds these four words came to me mm. fulfillment okay. love okay outstanding and world okay which is also f l o w fulfillment huh. love outstanding world so i believe and i i know to be true when you can find the intersection of the thing that fulfills you mm -hmm. where that fills your cup that feels like again this is exactly what i'm supposed to be doing i feel satisfied yeah I love what I'm doing. This mm -hmm. is a topic I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. I seem to always gravitate towards this topic. I'm outstanding at it or I want to be outstanding at it. Yeah. Right? Like you don't have to be outstanding now, but it's something that you're like, you know, for for, for me, it might be the way I use my voice or I, for you, it might be how you interact with people. You're mm -hmm. really good at it. Thanks. And then world being what does the world need? Hmm. And then not just like what does the world need right now? Like does it need world peace? Yes. Yeah. But what does the world need specifically from you? And when you can find the intersection of this F-L-O-W flow, I believe that's where that piece of purpose starts. Hmm. And so I found a tangible way to teach this yeah. so and bring it to the masses. And that's where Purpose to Profit started. So finding the flow and then saying, how can I now monetize it? Not because I need to, but by monetizing it, money is just a resource that helps you do what you want to do in a bigger way yeah. and to impact more people. So that's why I'm like, if we can take our, if all of us individually can take our purpose, mm -hmm. if we can discover it and, or at least start interacting with that word and then finding a way to make money doing it, mm -hmm. like that's, I, f I feel like that's the golden ticket in yeah, life, you yeah. know? Yeah, now, so when that's did, where it started. So I'm, I'm curious, do you remember the first time you made 100 grand in a year? Yeah, I mean, okay, the very first time in a year would yeah. have been at Oxford Properties. My yeah. salary jumped up from, I don't know, like I started at 80 and eventually worked my way up to the 100. And I thought, oh my gosh, 100 yeah. grand. Yeah. I, I know that was like, that was a lot of money. Yeah. And I was in my, I wasn't even in my 30s yet. Okay. So it felt so like a lot. Now yeah. here, so you, you talk a lot about feeling. Right. Like when you were doing that stuff, what did that feel like when I was working and making? Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an yeah. interesting journey, right? Like you you hear the number and then you're like, oh, this is great. And then three months happens. It's and then you've like somehow already upgraded your lifestyle yeah. to the extra 500 bucks a month you're getting or I mean, whatever. You, right? well, you got a good you got a good couch. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. But yeah, I think. So when I was making that money, I think now looking back, it's mm -hmm. hard, hard, hard to go right back to the moment of how I felt then. But I, f I feel like I never felt settled and I mm. never felt like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I felt like I was always striving to not, not that I, we're always striving for, to do more and, yeah. but like striving to like fit in was my thing. And I never mm. really felt like I was fitting in. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's cause I was trying to put myself into a box that I was never meant to be in. Wow. Um, and so that's kind of how I felt was like, okay, I've, I've made this, but I still don't, th this doesn't feel like it's it. Yeah. And even if I make 200, I don't think this is going to feel like it's it. And mm -hmm. I did make the 200 mm -hmm. and I, I think I felt even worse when I made the 200 Really? a couple years late. Like I mm -hmm. wrote, I jumped quick. Yes. Yeah. Because now it's like, I'm making all this money, but it's still not what I want. Like that disconnect is even bigger even in your head. Yeah. It's a really interesting feeling to be like. I remember I got offered a job uh, opportunity while I was searching for what I wanted to do next. 
that was going to start at 400,000 salary plus bonus up to 50% bonus. I'm like, that's, so wild. that's crazy. What and I that? turned it down. What was that doing? What? Like still in real estate. Still, yeah. Okay, still okay. Be like a CFO role at a real estate company, Okay. commercial real estate company. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even bother to interview for it because at that point I was like, I, I, I didn't really, I don't know what it was. It I just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't feeling it. right. And I was like, yeah. when you're already making 200 plus K, your lifestyle's good. Yeah, like an extra. So yeah, years. that could really upgrade your lifestyle. Well, what, you get a nicer house? I'd also had couch. the nice house yeah. and sold the nice house. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't like happy in that nice house, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had that, mm -hmm. that you know, forced, uh, you know, this beautiful house in Leslieville. And so I knew that it wasn't going to be the house that was going to make me happy. Yeah. So that also meant it wasn't going to be the extra 200 K that was going to make me happy. That must have taken a lot to like realize like that that must have been a journey in itself like even coming to terms with that. It wasn't it wasn't because I I think like yeah, at the time you're you feel like you're walking away from a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I was so um checked out of the role that I was in and yeah. and parts of the industry that I didn't like and mm -hmm. this role was just going to be that uh, like again exponentially yeah and so it didn't feel like like why would i move there when i'm already feeling this way so mm -hmm. I, that was actually a very easy decision for me to make to be what, honest what was that conversation with your parents like they because, don't they probably are, don't know that i walked away from that like i didn't yeah. tell them that that opportunity to interview with that company even came up because they didn't even want you to do oh my gosh do you think that they would be done? like now they're fine with it because i'm doing okay but like yeah. to say that i'm walking away from a salary to making nothing mm -hmm. and investing like i had some some money from a real estate sale that i had done and i used that mm -hmm. for me to invest mm -hmm. in me mm -hmm. like i took like 50 grand to 100 grand to just invest in myself mm -hmm. to start my business to fund my lifestyle essentially yeah, for yeah. that time yeah. as well as you know courses and things that i did um you know i did a, a bunch of courses yeah um, I, I still do like I did some stuff like a specialty a specialization in strategy with Harvard like this is all stuff I did after all of what I just told you yeah right yeah. I did that in 2021 cool I did a coaching certification I did all of these things that felt more aligned to where I'm trying to go mm -hmm. um, and I I think it's the best investment I've ever made I always tell people if you invest in yourself versus real estate or the stock market mm -hmm you have a chance for infinite return. Do you mm -hmm. know what an infinite return is? Something that gives you a return for the rest of your life and beyond. Because mm -hmm. it's it's impacting people long after you're gone. Yeah. By just investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? And invest in yourself to what? Show up as your highest and best use. Highest and best use. That's crazy. Right? So now you go off on this on this mm -hmm. world to start yeah. your own business. Yeah. What happens? Oh, this God. is Futura Funds? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so how did this... So now you're yeah. like, I want to do the same thing. Not the same thing. Same, same, but different. You know, yeah, except the way well, that you, you thought it was. I left and the idea came to me when I was at this event. Okay. So I go to this event and it was... I got, I was like, let me immerse myself with other startup founders. Like I, all my, my network was like... Real you estate. Know, real <laughs> estate. Like I call it pale, male, stale. You know, like that's kind of like... <laughs> what it was yeah. to this diverse, young, dynamic, energetic, energetic like, environment mm -hmm, of like mm -hmm. early stage tech founders. So I'd yeah. go to all these events. No cap rate talk. Yeah, yeah no, right, <laughs> exactly. No yeah. cap rate talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd go to these these startup events and I ended up at one that was like a prop tech event, so a real estate okay. tech startup. And this was before that was even like a term in Canada. This mm -hmm. is like 2018. And there was some... Um, uh, founders there that were like talking about their technology that they've developed and i'm just like this is a really cool tech yeah like have you talked to oxford properties about it have you talked to this company about it and they're like no because the thing is a lot of these people who are starting these technologies didn't come from the corporate. real estate industry of course and they didn't have the corporate background and mm -hmm. they were more techie or they came from different backgrounds mm -hmm. so they didn't have those relationships and in commercial real estate it's very relationship driven yep. business yeah um and i had those relationships and at, at that time i was actually sitting on two boards where it was the top real estate people on these boards why did you even join a board if you knew all oh stuff my gosh wasn't, oh so no the board part was like my favorite part of the industry really? how yeah did, how did you i them? loved that part like yeah. that was and i'm still really connected to some of these boards yeah um so they were like boards of networking associations cool um and so 
One of them was Toronto Crew, Commercial Real Estate Women. I ended up cool. like, joining it in 2013 and being the president of it by 2020. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a big deal. There, it's yeah. like 12,000 people across North America. Toronto is one of the larger chapters with 400 people. There's mm-hmm. like 80 chapters. And um, yeah, so that was one of the associations. And then the other one was NAOP. But either way, I had, through being on these boards, I had deep connections mm-hmm. with like literally sometimes the CEOs of the Oxford properties or the Slates or the Bental Green Oaks and mm-hmm. all of these different companies. So I met these tech early stage tech founders and said, yeah. have you met, have you gone into Oxford? Have you done this? And they're like, no. And then they also were, most of them also trying to raise capital. And in that moment, I said to a founder there, I just said, oh, I could help you do that. Like, you know, I could probably help you get a, a meeting with Oxford or mm-hmm. put you in front of some investors and they were like, that's amazing. And then in my, in, like right on the spot, I was like, okay, I'll send you some details tomorrow. I went home that night. I looked up like, like, like a rep, like almost like a broker letter, letter. Yeah. I called it a representation letter. Yeah. I, I found some like template online. Mm-hmm. And basically I said, okay, if I help you to raise capital, I'll take 5%. And if I help you to get uh, a revenue contract with this company, I'll mm-hmm. take two percent for two years like i just made up something yeah and i sent it and they were like sure because at the time most of those founders they were the only person on their team doing business development or fundraising or maybe them and one or two other people Mm -hmm. so adding a a person to that roster Mm -hmm. who is paid only on performance Mm -hmm. is like a no-brainer yeah it's like okay if you get something go ahead yeah exactly go ahead and i signed up eight prop tech companies within two months Wow. So yeah. you, so you just, just from said going to these events. Tech is my thing. Yeah. I, well, I stuck with in. what I, I knew. Well, you know, yeah. I felt like, okay, let me be like, I know about real estate. I can get these yeah. connections. Yeah. Since, since then I have broadened it and I've mm-hmm. worked with founders outside of just real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always try to work with people where I understand their, their business to some extent. I don't yeah. have to understand all the tech, but I understand the business. It's a product I would use or I could recommend to someone else using. Mm-hmm. And I believe mm-hmm. in the founder and I believe in the brand. And I believe they're trying to do good things in this world. Yeah. If all of that is there, like I'm happy. Checks all happy, the boxes. Yeah. Let's go. Then I'm happy to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if the founder's committed to the to the problem they're trying to solve. Yeah. Those are that that one is probably number one for me. Yeah. Why did those why did those things matter to you so much? Was this at a time when you were like starting to shift into like purpose driven? Yeah, kind mm-hmm. of. It's like, you know, if you can see that the founder is really passionate about the problem they're going to solve when mm-hmm. they're then faced with any type of adversity. Mm-hmm. If the why right, matters yeah. more than the hows or what's happening at the time, they're going to stick with that problem and they're mm-hmm. going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really because you don't want someone who's just fickle, who's just going to jump at the uh, the sign of like any any problem, yeah. which happens every single day when you're a founder. You know this, right? And so yeah. um, if you're if it's someone who's really committed, there, there's some reason why they're compelled mm-hmm. to solve this problem in the mm-hmm. world, mm-hmm. whether they experienced it themselves or they see the need you know, there's a gap in the marketplace and they want to be the ones to solve it mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Maybe it's their backstory, like the backstory I just told you. Yeah, yeah. Part of the reason I do what I do is because I saw that I always felt kind of like overlooked and under supported mm-hmm. in realizing my own dreams. And so I don't want anyone to feel like that. That's yeah, why I do yeah. what I do. So if, mm. and I'm really connected to that. Mm-hmm. That's why I have a podcast is to tell the untold stories, right? Like mm-hmm. I really want to bring a voice to the people who don't have one sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's something I'm deeply passionate about. So I look for that in others. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so now was it with this business, was that the first time you made a hundred grand in a month? Yeah. Right. Like, so if you go out there and you, you, at the rates I told you, I needed to raise yeah. $2 million yeah. at a 5% commission and I could raise that. Now, did it always happen? In a month, like I might have been working with that founder for two months, three months, yeah. and then it happens in a day, in a right? Day. Like it yeah. just happens. But I think um, that's when I started to learn. I'm like, okay, do I want to work with, right? So if I want to make a hundred grand this month, mm-hmm. right, I could work deep with one founder, yeah, right, and do that mm-hmm. and raise them two million dollars if that's what they're raising. Mm-hmm. That also requires like a hundred investor meetings, right? Yeah. And I started to learn in that process while it sounded really sexy and mm-hmm. like, oh, I can make a lot of money. I just need this many founders and this much money to raise and and I can do this all day long. 
the part that where I had to spend the most time was investor facing. Mm. But the part that I enjoyed the most was founder Founder facing. facing. I would spend a lot of time with founders to understand their product, to go through their pitch decks with them, for them to pitch me, for me to like fully understand what they're they're doing. And I would spend a lot of time coaching them through yeah, that yeah. and building them up and, and strategizing and also thinking about other verticals that they could get their business into. Like mm-hmm. that was the part that I really enjoyed. Enjoy. I also found that, you know, if you're working with um, a founder that doesn't have this confidence in themselves it's really hard they might have the best idea ever yeah right and you could mm-hmm. really believe in what they're trying to do but they're not raising the money just because of how they're maybe presenting themselves and or, just one thing that they don't believe thing. it's got to change yeah. yeah and so i liked coaching them through that process and yeah. seeing that transition so I was, the part i liked most about the process i wasn't monetizing that piece mm. and that's when i was like okay that's when i decided to do the coaching certification because i realized I really enjoyed the coaching piece. Yeah. And you don't need a certification to be a coach. Everyone yeah. calls themselves a coach these days. Yeah. And I also believe that. Like, I don't believe I needed the certification. I started getting clients while I was in the certification. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, so, um, but yeah, that's where that transition happened. And then hmm. it further transitioned because the number one question I started being asked by mm-hmm. people from my network, my previous network was, how did you make this transition, Farah, from yeah. corporate? Like you're like MBA, CA, CFO track, like traditionally, super people traditional. People would be like, "That's the you That's made the dream. it, you made the it." That's the and dream, then you right? a chose to leave, but now you're doing really well at what you're doing. Like, yeah. how did you take off the corporate hat and go on and become an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. or just decide to bet on yourself? And mm-hmm. I, I get asked that like all the time, mm-hmm. and I was getting asked it enough that you know people were starting to ask me. To, to coach them to coach through that them. process. Yeah. So you... now my business is really geared towards helping me mid to senior level corporate professionals who are looking for more meaning and purpose in their life mm-hmm. that know they're meant for more. Maybe it's that they want to go start their very first business and make yeah. a similar transition to what I do. Mm-hmm. And it might not be that I want to go start a tech company. It might just say, be that I want to go monetize the things I was already doing, yeah. but do it for myself now. Mm-hmm. Or I have a business idea or I have a passion I want to pursue, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. I also coach people who are like, I just want to do, I want to change my career trajectory. I want to stay in a profession, yeah. but it, not I don't want it to look like what it's looking like now. Yeah, yeah. All of the end goal of my my coaching is just to help people live a more aligned, purposeful, authentic life mm-hmm. for themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's really where I'm focused. But that was a transition that happened by me going through that same transition yeah. so that I could now help others do the same. Yeah. So what is the kind of like some of the first steps towards that transition? Yeah. I think it's really being honest with yourself about um like I, I was actually just having this conversation with someone yesterday i said she's got she's at a major crossroads okay in, in her life and yeah. in, in business right now like in her career and whether she wants to go you know to the next level in her career to switch careers to start a business all the things that we're going through at yeah i said whatever you decide make it be something that is true to you mm. Not what your husband wants, not what your dad wants, not what you think your friends want, not yeah. what the industry wants of you, but what what is it what you, you that you want to do? Yeah. Even if the thing sounds crazy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I've had someone who wanted, who was a corporate lawyer who wanted to start a baking business. Sounds crazy to the rest of the world, not to me because mm-hmm. I've tasted her baked goods yeah. and they're amazing, <laughs> yeah. right? So that's probably her highest and best use, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I said... Start asking yourself this question. Sit with yourself and ask it and take out the ego out of it. Take out the like, oh, I want to be in this position because this is going to look good and I want this title and I want to make this much money because I had all those things. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it doesn't doesn't satisfy you. How do you just all of a sudden just not think with that, with, with, from that lens, right? Like we're, you're most so, so often we're intoxicated by other people's definition of success. Yes. Right. And it's so hard to kind of like just, get a moment of silence where you, you're not distracted yeah. by well, what that, that is? Like, well, that's how do you... why it's really good to work with a coach or to yeah. take my my Purpose to Profit Masterclass. Sign up, sign up. Yeah. If you're looking for... <laughs> yeah. We'll put the link in the DMs. But yeah. to, to be honest, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. It's not an easy thing. I think how I've been able to do it is I've yeah. also worked with a coach that, okay. you know, when I, def- when I said out loud to her what I wanted to do, she called bullshit on it. 
She was really? like, Cara, this isn't it. I and, know. And what was it that you said at the time? I don't do know what I said even yeah, anymore yeah. because I'm not doing that thing. Yeah. And, and then I was like, whoa, okay, I got to really dig deep. So the questions you can start asking yourself, because it is it is a hard thing to say, like, oh, I'm just going to blow up my definition of success yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah, just because this girl said it on a podcast. Yeah, but right. like, yeah, let's give some people some tools. Like, some how tools. do you actually yes. do this? You know? So we were chatting earlier and I said, what is the thing that you would just do for free? Okay. Right. Ask yourself if I could do this thing, mm -hmm. I would like I would like for me, it is sitting on a coaching call. I would yeah, do that. Yeah. It is recording a podcast episode. I love doing those. It's speaking on stages. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, like those things were not highly monetizable. Mm. You can say, oh, I just had a conversation with someone and I helped transform their thinking and I monetized that. Like we're talking 20 years ago. Yeah. Today that is a thing. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you whatever your answer is to the question of what is the thing you would do for free, mm -hmm. right? There's likely a way to monetize that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is the thing that when you're doing it, it gives you energy, it doesn't suck your energy. Mm -hmm. So whether it is, I like talking with people or I like sitting and doing creative work. I like creating art on Canva. Like what, what's the thing you can do for hours, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one question. What would you do for free? Like what, what do you naturally, what gives you that energy? Okay. And then what is that, what is the problem in the world that you feel like needs to be solved that you, you're constantly thinking about? Mm -hmm. like you're it's always on your mind yeah and what was that problem for you i think it was about like helping underrepresented founders yeah. have a voice have a platform have access at the time it was like have access to capital so because they weren't getting like i don't know if you knew the stats at the time this is back in 2018 2019 where only two percent of all venture capital dollars were, we're going, going to, women. to to women. Yeah, and I was like, "How is this when women are starting businesses mm -hmm. at higher rates than men?" Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and, have the, great and all ideas. the success and all the success metrics point that if yeah. you have a women led company, it's going through the roof, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. And so that at the time was a problem that I really wanted to figure out. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's different problems, but you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. The purpose piece starts somewhere; it evolves. But if you're not even asking yourself those questions. What's the problem that I want to solve in this world? Where do I want to make the yeah. most impact? Who do I want to make the most impact on? Now, some people are like, okay, well, how do I find a problem? Right? Because yeah. what's what's interesting. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of problems out there. There but yeah. is, right? But if you look at so many people, like their biggest problem is that they don't have time, right? Like they're, yeah. they're, you're commuting all the time. Then you work eight hours, but it ends up being 10 hours and then you have to commute back so, so and then you, so you, you got to take your to kids that? to soccer. Like not the not ones... to cut you off. Yeah, please go, go cut me off. I'm down. <laughs> Beyonce yeah. and Javon and Farah all have the same 24 hours in the day. Yeah. We get to choose how we're going to use those hours. Yeah. Right. That's a choice that all of us have. And you might say, oh, Beyonce has a whole team mm -hmm. so she can show up like that. Didn't start that yeah, way. but she didn't start that way. Yeah. Exactly. She didn't. So she chose to spend it hours recording and dancing and performing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you that's are really that's passionate that's what i do as well right way, like yeah. you use your spare time right and so <laughs> no I, I use it to dance and record oh dance and record okay yeah. i'd love to see some of those so. <laughs> all right if you want the extended version <laughs> <laughs> yeah stay on after the, the, the podcast right yeah, um yeah. so like okay that that's a choice maybe while you're commuting you're listening mm -hmm. to a podcast that helps you like improve on a certain skill yeah Right. Like you're going to carve out time for the things that matter, matter to you. Even I say to people, if you could just give yourself half an hour a day or five hours on the weekend, it's going to compound something five hours a week. Right. Over a, or 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Let's say you could do 10 hours a week. That's mm -hmm. 500 hours over the co course of a year. Mm -hmm. If you did something for 500 hours, you're going to build something. Something's yeah. going to come of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. I think where I think it's just about being really intentional also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about where your time goes. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I used to be the yes girl. Okay. I said yes to everything. Every event, every networking opportunity, every board, every association. I didn't know how to say no. Mm -hmm. But you know how I know how to say no now? Because I have a purpose. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't align, if this thing doesn't move me closer to the purpose, it's a hell hell no. Mm -hmm. It is a filter now. When you mm -hmm. have a purpose it's like okay, does this help me bring that purpose to life or not? Does hmm. being at that event help me? It, it's like no more FOMO. Yeah. No more decision make, decision paralysis analysis. None mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. And so when you have that, 
it also helps you decide how you, how you spend your time. Mm-hmm. If you're like, my family is really important, mm-hmm. then maybe going and starting a business that's going to take 80 hours of your week so that one day you'll have more time with your family isn't, isn't the path. Mm-hmm. What about picking up a business that allows you to work from home, that maybe allows you to spend a lot of time with your children because it's flexible hours, right? But you have to know what your purpose is and how you want to spend your time hmm. so that you can then intentionally choose where your hours get allocated. But hmm. some of us are going in, clocking eight hours a day to build someone else's dream yeah. life. You know 100%. that, right? When you are spending eight hours a day working in a job, you're working at Apple, you know, back in the day, you're building Steve Jobs' dream, mm-hmm. not your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're building right? Oxford's dream, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. You're whatever. You know, I was like making these pension fund owners because yeah. that's who the investors in our fund was mm-hmm. richer, hmm. right? Like that's that just didn't feel aligned. Not the anymore. problem you wanted to solve. Not the problem I wanted. To solve. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what do what what does a day in fire shoes look like these days? Great, great question. So I probably spend on any given day two to three hours in coaching calls with okay. people. Okay. Okay. I spend one or two hours like in doing like content creation, whether that's like emails, Selfies, working, yeah. TikTok dances. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. No, I and and like just working with my virtual assistant to create the different like um, content pieces that we want to create. So yeah. there's that course creation as well. Like okay. I'm dropping some new things that you'll be All seeing right. soon. All right. So like creating go. the back end of that um, podcast. Yeah. recording as well that takes up some time i've streamlined that process because mine's not as high tech as yours but we're, we're, we're chatting <laughs> about, about that yeah. um and and then i also like i do create a lot of like i do some corporate work workshops as well oh cool yeah and so like creating proposals for that doing mm. some business development mm-hmm. i go to networking events speaking events deli- yeah. and then delivering the workshops right yeah, so like yeah. there's always different stages i'm in whether i'm like in delivery mode of the product mm-hmm. or creation mode of the product yeah or yeah like fulfillment when i'm doing huh. coaching um but all of those pieces are all things i just like really love doing i yeah. would say like the social media piece is the only part where i'm like ah. pain yeah sometimes <laughs> it's a pain but yeah. i that's why I've hired someone because yeah, it's yeah. not my highest and best use to like do the back end of it. Like mm-hmm. the ideas of mm-hmm. what's being put out, those are all mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the back end admin of yeah. all of it and the creation and the Canva, Messy. like I don't need to do that. <laughs> I don't need to do that. Yeah, yeah fair enough. I, I kind of want to put a section in the book where there's like so many different. So I'm, I decided I'm, I'm going to write a book. Okay, about this, I love right? that. Inter- I'm sorry. planning to write one too. Pl- so yeah. Now. yeah um, right? <laughs> so we're at that point in the podcast. There, yeah. Cheers. Well, my tea's done. So yeah. I can't. But but um, yeah, so put in this section and everyone's going to have like, there's going to be all these different like job types and like industries and stuff like yeah. that. But I kind of want to highlight what a day in each person's shoes looks yeah, like. Yeah, great. You know, because it, like really it's for kids to choose different career paths other than lawyer, engineer, doctor, accountant. Exactly. Right. Because like when, like you were saying before, like we're just intoxicated by other people's perception and definition of what yes. success actually is. But like, you know, there's a hundred ways to make a hundred K. Literally, there's so many different ways to get it. And and usually when you think about someone's day, you're yeah. only seeing the highlight reels of what they do. You're yeah. not seeing like even on social media, mm-hmm. even if you think of a CEO, you're like, oh, he was just speaking at this event or doing that. Like yeah. there's so much else that goes on in the day. I will also say like no two days are the same. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I think is the best part is I have a lot of flexibility. Mm. When you're your own boss, you get to decide when you work, uh, like who you work with, yeah, how you work, yeah. where you work from. Yeah. And so, and when you take a nap, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and like, just, I've been able to be a lot more present with my family because of it. Cause I'm wow. not just like waiting for the vacation days and the, you know, the weekend or whatever yeah. I can pop down to London, Ontario to see my parents midweek if I need yeah. to. So that flexibility has been great and I can work from there when I'm there. How do your parents feel about what you do now? Do they even know? They probably don't even Yeah, no, they, <laughs> they, they do understand it. And they, you know, my dad has been saying to me, he's like, just keep doing what you're doing. Like people need to, to hear your message. That's awesome. And like when he sees something related to my field, like yeah. it, it could be like very loosely related <laughs> he'll send it to me to yeah. be like you're on the right track yeah. like and i'm like thanks dad i didn't like i guess i still do need the validation no yeah. i don't need it in the way that i used to but it's cute yeah. that he 
you know, still gives it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's really yeah. cool. So, so now you have all these different things going on. You got a podcast. You got yeah. books coming. You got courses coming. Now, what what made you want to do a podcast? Oh man, I think I just started listening to a lot of podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, I start. I was like an early adopter. I would say probably twenty sixteen. I okay. don't know if that's an early adopter for podcasts. Probably. Um, I mean, they've been along around a lot longer yeah. and the podcast that i loved the most was how i built this oh my god Guy Ross. Guy Ross that was killed like, it. at 2016 was that was that was the one I right was like, and he this had all crazy. so the, the thing is though he had all the best like he had like his businesses at the time you know like starbucks banks yeah. yeah. um like all all the big big guys yeah, actually Zappos, the first one i listened yeah. to was this woman who started cisco systems and urban decay a makeup company I was like, okay this is crazy yeah i'm forgetting her name right now it's but okay. anyways when I listened to it, I loved how he interviewed. Like I loved the the backstory he would get into. Mm -hmm. My podcast actually follows a, like a similar story, but what I wanted to do that was different than Guy Raz was to tell the untold stories of founders mm. that you would never, never hear about. Yeah. Um, again, bringing a voice to the underrepresented. And I felt like the, a podcast was a good medium for me, mm -hmm. um, especially like then, unlike today, like don't you didn't, don't have to even be on camera. Yeah. It's just your voice. Um, it's like natural. I love being in conversation. So it just like felt like after listening to enough podcasts that I was like, oh, I could probably do this. But mm -hmm. it was, I didn't start till 2022. Oh, wow. I actually okay. bought my mic in 2020. Okay. At the start of COVID. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start this podcast. It took me two years. The, the mic actually is a blue Yeti, but it sat in the box no for way. two years. So and then I finally was like, Farah, you can't like, by then I'd listen to even a thousand more podcasts and mm. I'm just like, you, you got to do this. And yeah. Just spit the bullet. So what, uh, like that must've been a, a, you know, a, a thing in itself, like just watching that mic there, yeah. like, yeah, of okay, course. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. Why do you think it took you so long to jump? I think I had, um, my own fear around like putting yourself out there mm -hmm. and like being, judged right like hmm. what if i fumble my words what if no one listens all of this and then finally i i realized my purpose is greater than my fear mm, right but... like it's not about the podcast isn't even about me it's mm -hmm. about these these founders that i'm interviewing yeah. and i also share my own journey on there yeah but that again is about the people i'm trying to reach so i was like at some point the thing you're trying to do has to be greater than the little bit of fear that you have around doing it and i got to that point Wow. So yeah. how did you, so now you got this coaching, you got this coaching business, yeah. you're out of the fundraising business. Yes. Now, how are you growing your coaching business these days? So what, what's like, yeah. the, what are some of the moves? You got a bunch of tactics yeah. on from, from the accounting bleh, um, to the real estate, to the raising funds for other companies. Yeah. Now you're on this journey uh, yes. again, you know, yeah. it's not your first rodeo here. Yeah. So what type of, what type of skills, what type of for sure. um, moves yeah. you bring into the table these days? So when I first started, my program was pretty one-to-one, -one, right? yeah. like one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, not scalable because mm -hmm. at a certain point, there's only certain hours in the day. And I'm yeah. also not trying to work 60 hours a week just doing coaching calls. Yeah. Um, so then I created a course. Okay. okay. So I could like see, have 10 people at once. But my vision is to create a course that I'd have a thousand people or just an evergreen course that yeah. someone can just take on their own time and then jump into a membership community that I have that can help support you through cool. the journey of being on that course, but mm -hmm. also introduce new topics. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I'm planning to scale in 2024. Yeah. That's what's going on behind the scenes. It's okay, like okay. recording this course, mm -hmm. getting the membership all set up. Mm -hmm. And I want coaching to be more accessible. So it's going to be a yeah. lower ticket membership. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've played around with Oh, like, do I create a high ticket mastermind? And like, I'll have di offers at different levels. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want there to be a level that is accessible for more, more people. Um, and so that's kind of on the B2C side, I okay. would say of, you know, like, so the, the course, the membership, yeah. um, and then still doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching. I've also been doing corporate workshops. So like, and I love, I love doing those. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to build that side of my business up too, because yeah. once I've created the workshops, it doesn't take me as much time to just, just still, I just have to go facilitate. And I love yeah. being in person facilitating. Yeah. Um, the B2C side is mostly done online. And so I, I want that element of like in-person interaction, yeah. teaching live in front, in front of people. Yeah. Um, and then the other part that I'm looking to monetize over time is also just speaking engagements like cool. i 
you know, from a young age was always like, I want to be on stages speaking around the world. Yeah. I want a speech competition in grade four. And I was okay. like, oh my God. And ever since amazing. then, you're like, this is it. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of like put that aside. And then yeah. I did get, you know, I've had one paid speaking opportunity where I was flown out to Seattle. And, okay. And it okay. was like, it was cool. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to do more of this. I want to be yeah. like the next Mel Robbins. So cool. I don't see that. Like, I mean, over time, I think that can monetize in a huge way. Mm-hmm. That's less about that for me right now i just like get so much energy yeah. from doing it yeah yeah um and then there's another thing that's in the works too um that's gonna happen in march which is like a retreat okay uh, like a, a one day retreat cool focus on health and wealth this is gonna be your first one yeah and bringing Whew. together like all the good people i know in my network doing great things yeah for like a you know full day health and wealth summit mm-hmm. i haven't come up with the full name yet but that's kind of the theme and cool. so those are the the different ways that i'm thinking yeah to expand and then but the like the longer term thing that i would love to do is like once that part of my business is earning enough like passive income as well as obviously active income, but like a stable amount of passive income through courses, through things that I can evergreen and membership and all that, Mm -hmm. that the money that I make from that to reinvest back to start like an incubator for, you know, probably high school, probably university level students to like actually help them start building business ideas from from that point and and funding them and supporting them to do that. That's That's kind of like the bigger dream. Yeah. So why, what about corporate workshops do you like? I think I just love it because I get that world and Mm -hmm. I was in that world and I, Mm. and I I see, like, I see it so from a very different perspective now. And like, I love bringing that perspective. And I think that people resonate with the perspective I bring because I've been in their shoes before. Yeah. And so to help people shift their perspective and think differently about their their jobs and what they do and how they do it Mm -hmm. and to to do it in a more purposeful, intentional way to show up with more confidence because I didn't always have the confidence that I I have now back then. It just feels very fulfilling because I'm when you're whenever you're helping people who were in the shoes you were in, there's something fulfilling about that. Yeah. Yeah. What are what do you think the books that made Farah Farah are? Ooh, a lot of good books. Okay. I'm like, I, I you know what? I'm like, let me pull up my I'm going to pull out the phone. All right, all right. Is that okay? No, it's not. I got to no pull out my allowed. audible. Okay, so no. one is definitely Untethered Soul by okay. Michael Singer. I don't know if you've okay. interacted nope. with that book. He's been on Oprah a lot, okay. like, you know, one of those Oprah books. So and, it's it's yeah. really the concept in Untethered Soul is like, uh, you know, you are not your thoughts and like separating yourself from your thoughts and like hmm. separating the ego from the self. Wow. It's deep. I know. So wow. that's That's a big one. Like I've all... I always ask myself, is ego Farah answering this? Ooh, and not that ooh. ego is bad. It's just like a real check in with yourself of like, yeah. you know, am I answering this because this is what I really want or yeah. is it that this is what I think other people want or this like goes back yeah, to that, that same all of that. success. Is this, is this something that other people want or something that I actually exactly. want? Exactly. Wow. And then, okay, let me see what's, what's that was the, the one though. No, I want the ones that you just wanted. The yeah, one. okay, so not, the not ones just that come. The one, but I'm the like, ones... I have a whole list of them. They're no. not coming to me. I liked, okay, I liked Atomic Habits by, by James, James Clear. Clear. Yeah, that one. I don't know, like it's just simple, but it's good. Okay. Um, what's another? Oh my god, I'm not. Oh, okay, this one. I'm not like in love with him as a person, but the concept is amazing. Seller be sold by Grant. Thor- uh, Grant Cardo. Thornton, no, Grant Cardone. <laughs> Grant Thornton. I was no, like, no, please, I used to work no. there back in the day. Yeah, so no, I was like, please, no, not Grant. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, Grant banger. Cardone. I just okay. think like it's a very good concept on like how to sell. Yeah, um, yeah. And for someone who has had a hard time selling, like, like you had a hard time selling. Oh my, I still do. What? Whatever I you're still, selling, I'll oh buy. Oh my it. gosh. Yeah, yeah. I think sales is very much when you are selling from an authentic place of like what I'm selling. Yeah is like a, I'm, it's almost like now I'm at a place where it's like if I don't sell this thing it's a disservice to people yeah, to it, not get to like this. interact with it yeah but before it was like oh I can't ask for that I'm not worthy of that like mm. there was a lot of work that I had to do around limiting mindsets around mm. money and wow. uh, and myself and my worthiness wow. 
to be able to sell. So that's, that's why I actually, a lot of my coaching, I say to people, I can teach you about business, but my coaching is an infusion of business and mindset. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of mindset coaching out there and there's a lot of business coaching out there. Mm -hmm. But if someone teaches you a sales strategy, but you have limiting mindsets about your worth, you're work. never going to make a sale. Yeah. And so while you're doing, you need, both congruently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need the mindsets up before you can even be introduced to the sales strategy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. piece, right? Mm -hmm. Cause like, so that, um, but that was again, a journey that I went on mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. to be at a place to say, no, I am worthy of that. Yes, I can increase my rates. No, I don't mm -hmm. need to work with people who are undercutting me or like, you know, all yeah. of those things, yeah. right? Um, and we're not really taught those things. Mm -hmm. And our money story comes from like, you know, how we were raised, what we saw, what examples we've had mm -hmm. around us. And no one really goes deep into like why you might have that belief you have about yourself yeah, and your yeah. worthiness and money. Hmm. Um, so Seller Be Sold was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's um, yeah, good. I, yeah. I, I, I much preferred rather than just giving the titles, like the reasons why behind why? them. Yeah, yeah, because then people could actually know like, oh, is this a book that I should read right now rather than totally. just, oh, you should read this book. It's exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. give me some context, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So any any yeah. others that come to mind or those are, those are kind of like the three favorites? I know. I feel like I'm forgetting like a That's major a book right now that I always recommend to people. But you know, it's just like not popping to the... Yeah, yeah, not coming to the forefront. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. If yeah. anything, we'll get if it, you. If, if, if not, I'll send it to you. You can add it to the show yeah, notes. Yeah, there. no, send it in yeah. a selfie and then we'll add it yeah. to the video. Oh, you know what? One was like good just from a concept of when you are starting a business. I actually, this one came up in my MBA. Okay. And it's it's kind of like resurfaced amongst people lately called the Lean Startup. Uh, Have you heard of that one? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. really about that MVP, like creating mm -hmm. that minimum viable product. And the reason why that, I mean, it sounds so technical and I actually just contributed on LinkedIn to an article about like, you know, this minimum viable product. And mm -hmm. I was just like, that concept works well for me because it, I have, I suffer from like perfectionism. So I don't want to put anything out in the world until it's perfect. And I've really mm -hmm. had to let that go. If you listen to my mm -hmm. podcast, I talk a lot about that. And so the MVP concept is like, you can just get out something, mm -hmm. a beta. Mm -hmm. If you're going to wait till the thing is perfect, A, first of all, you you could put out something perfect to you and no one buys it. So the yeah. MVP allows you to test, iterate, learn, change, all those things. Yeah. Because you're just putting out like a newsletter before it becomes a book, because, yeah. right? Like whatever. Yeah. Samples. Samples. And so that concept I like because it's like helped me get over the perfectionism. It's like better better to get it out than to never get it out yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Get something it out doesn't there. serve anybody if you just keep it within. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I like I like that book because I'm just like, okay, like, uh, oh yeah, I can't, I ended up coming up with my own saying around perfectionism, which is like, I was, again, having one of those flow moments. And mm -hmm. there's a saying out there that's, I didn't create, which was like uh, something about imperfect action. Okay. Do you know that one? It's like, it's better to take imperfect action than to wait to do it perfectly or something. Hmm. But then I was thinking like, what does imperfect action actually get you? Yeah. It gets you impact. Hmm. And if you think about the first three letters of the word imperfect, I-M-P, and then action, A-C-T, oh, impact, geez. right? Cool. It's, anyways. Yeah, yeah. And so... Yeah, if you just act imperfectly, you don't overthink, you're going to you're yeah. going to either impact yourself or someone else in some mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. Yeah. That's deep. All from the lean startup, but like, you know, like sometimes it it you need those concepts that are like a little bit more tangible to help yeah. you realize, okay, I can just get something out there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you think that Farah that was super corporate successful? Yeah. You know, super big house in Leslieville or whatever. Yeah. What what do you think the current coach Farah would tell her or no a better question yeah. what do you think that Farah needed to hear oh okay I would tell that Farah that um to not really care about what anyone else thinks mm -hmm. right to to live life for herself to know that her dreams are valid that um Ooh, I'm gonna, I'm like gonna get emotional. No, just you know, because okay. I'm looking. We, I'm thinking. I know. I'm girl, thinking back to that person because I feel yeah. so different from that person, and I'm like mm -hmm. trying to relate to who she was. I think you know, I was really insecure, mm -hmm. and I I think 
I didn't have enough people or myself. Oh, who cares? Who cares about the people? Yeah. I didn't have. Who cares about other people? Yeah, people. no. Like who cares? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. I didn't have that self love or self belief in, in you know at the time. And I would say like I would tell her to just believe in herself, mm -hmm. that she's worthy, mm -hmm. that she is um, more than capable, that her ideas matter and to just go for it that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be perfect and even i think that was a big part of it like i felt like i always had to show up perfectly that's why I had the perfect house the perfect husband the perfect job and i wasn't happy so i think mm -hmm. it would be a reminder that those none of that matters your happiness matters so go do the things that make you happy mm -hmm. and don't feel like you need to justify what that is to other people yeah um and that when you are living authentically and in a happy way whatever that looks like for you, that you can actually make a living doing that. Because hmm. I always thought you lived life to then have the happiness, to then have, you know what I mean? Like you, you work the nine to five to make the money to one day eventually retire to then go do all the things that you want to do in life. Mm -hmm. And I would tell her that, no, do them now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I think there's a lot more I would tell her, but those would those would be the, the things. And to just have more confidence. Hmm. in herself um although i i do believe confidence comes through just action mm -hmm. so i would also say just all the ideas i've had so many ideas over the years like i've had business ideas for a long time i would have told her to just act on any of them hmm. you know would you just believe take it, that though? first action would you would you believe it back then maybe not no. <laughs> i don't know yeah um i think if i had someone who was a cheerleader for me back then saying all those things maybe yeah. but i think the important thing is to not need the cheerleader like sometimes you do need a coach or some support mm -hmm. but to eventually become your own cheerleader mm -hmm. cheerleader mm -hmm. right because if we're always looking for for validation approval from out there and we don't give it to ourselves yeah. that's like that's a journey that's just gonna keep going right wow. once you can start giving it to yourselves and that's hard mm -hmm. i still work on that trust mm -hmm. me i just mm -hmm. had a conversation with a friend related to something along those lines and then and then she's like but that's where the work is farah this is a good friend of mine i'm Jeez. like yeah you're right like i clearly there's another layer for me to go through to like mm -hmm. not always need outside validation for things yeah right but that's how our society works sometimes so it's yeah. like easy to get yeah. caught up in that but yeah, I, I would tell her to just like love herself more. Wow. Well, yeah. We really appreciate you sharing this version yeah. of Bar with us. And oh, thank you. Flipping through some of the old chapters as well. It's been fun. Yeah. yeah like, you yeah. enjoyed it. What's it like it's being on the other side of the table? Oh, man. Um, I loved it. But I think I prefer to be on that side, to be <laughs> honest. No, I think, I mean, I have a lot that I like to share, but it, it's... Um, I love just like bringing this, these kinds of stories out of other people as yeah, well in the yeah. way that you're doing. And so like, I'm learning a lot from you just, I'm like, Oh, really? I can like ask some of some questions like this and oh, I'll get okay. that type of answer. I really like your interview style. So, oh, cool. um, yeah, I didn't rely yeah. on notes today. I know so. no notes. So you're a natural yeah. at it. And yeah, yeah no, just it's, like been, it's been fun being you know? on this side, like yeah. reminiscing on some of the things I've gone through has been has been nostalgic and it's been fun. Yeah, yeah. cool. Well, we, we really appreciate you thank flipping you. us through some of those pages. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, appreciate all y'all for tuning in. So thanks so much for watching another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. That's Far Kimji, Purpose to Profits. Yes, Purpose to Profit. Founder, yeah. coach, mentor, podcaster, all of the above. Too many cool things to fit into a box and a label. But make sure you follow her. <laughs> Where can we follow you, Farah? You can follow me right now um, at Purpose with Farah on okay. Instagram. Okay. Um, you can also follow me at um, on LinkedIn, just Farah Kimji. You can look okay. me up on LinkedIn. Those are the two platforms that I'm most dominant on, LinkedIn and Instagram. Perfect. Yeah. And, and if she's got any others by the time this drops, we'll make sure we put them in the description down below. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Javon.ca, and we will see you on the next episode. Peace. Peace.